Hey everyone, and welcome back to uh, Cooking with Big Mark. Today we are talking about mussels. Well, that's going to come to that. It's like the shell game, we're going to shift it around. We started off thinking about linguine with clams. It's one of my uh, one of my favorite dishes. And I was reading an article, uh, sorry, video on on New Zealand and the agriculture of, of mussels. There, they spend billions of dollars, and they take these things right from gestation period right to maturity. And they have every step of the way is now done, you know, artificially. And it's just amazing. And they're in these inlets along the coast, and of course they filter the water, so they clean the water at the same time. So it's a symbiotic relationship with the coastline as well, which is really nice. Then I start thinking about well, clams, what you, mussels. Maybe I can do mussels with linguine. Why mussels versus clams? Well, mussels, first of all, are much cheaper. For two pounds of mussels, about five or six bucks, you do the same amount of meat to get out. And clams, because the shells are so much bigger and heavier, uh, you have to probably spend around 14, 18 bucks for the same thing. I also think that the mussels are, have a little, a little sweeter flavor, and uh, you're not dealing, you know, it's just, it's just, just an easier, just an easier way to do it. That's all. The reason they're cheaper is because they're fine, and clams like to sit in sand and move around. A bunch of mussels are on the rope that you know they never move. So then I said, okay, well, how are we going to do it? Then I thought of doing it for a group. So what I'm talking about today is uh, doing mussels with pasta for a group. And you do that by doing, uh, you know, a pre-prep in the a.m. of the day and do it serve at night or the day before and serve it the next day. And you heard me talk about casseroles, other things that are mixtures that they mellow overnight or something. And the same thing happens to this. I've been making clam chow. I noticed it. I don't know what it is it's like a sweet of mellow flour. I don't know if they melt together or what it is, but it, it, it's true. It really does happen. So how do you do this? Uh, well, then I start thinking about the pasta. At my age, you know, you have the linguine, you pot and spaghetti, you get it in a fork and you roll it up on the spoon and you go to put it in. But if you want to stab a piece of either clam or mussel to have with it, It'll all unravel again and fall out. So I said, well, heck with it. I'll change the pasta and get something smaller. And then, so on my spoon, I can now get both meat and pasta and juice together in one, one umamis, is such a word, uh, bite. Mm. So here's how you do it. Again, you, you get your, uh, you get a pan, take about two, two and a half cups of white wine and put it in. It could be water and stock too, the white wine gives you a little more zinc. And at that point, you can, uh, you know, do anything you want with it to enhance it. Uh, with adding lemon, you can use celery, onions, uh, carrots. And, you know, if you're doing a stock, you can use bay leaf or any other, uh, you know, any kinds of adornments. Each ethnic group would have their own flavors of things that they, that they want to add into it. Chilies, you know, whatever. Whatever aromatics turn you want, you, you can put in at this point. You get that to a boil, you put your mussels in it. You put them in, cover, you steam them for four to five minutes, and that's all. Uh, halfway through, just give the pan a little shake so those that are lodged up, you know, can't open up and get loose. Take off the cover. When you're doing this, you have a bowl ready with a uh, colander or a sieve, and you take the, the muscle meats and pour it right through that, reserving the liquid, which is your real flavor. That's the best part of it now. Then you take that, if it did into a pan, you want to put it on and reduce it down by a third to enhance the flavor. Now the mussels are cooled a little bit. You just take them, you flick out the meat. You can do it with your fingers or you can use a little double shell thing they do. I think they pull it out with the shell when they're eating. It's kind of a neat way to, to, to eat the uh, meat, to meat mussels. All right, so now we have the meat separate out in the bowl, you want to put a little bit of either uh, of the liquid around it, maybe a little oil, light oil, just to keep it moist. And you get your broth. So there's the first part of it. Now we come to pasta, which you again can do ahead of time if you want. If you get your pot of water going, about a tablespoon of salt for each gallon. And you bring it up to the boil, put the pasta in. If it says uh, the packet six to eight minutes, you do it six minutes. If it says eight to ten, do it eight. You want to do mm -hmm. a, you know, a little before al dente because it's going to go back into the hot sauce later on. When it comes out, go take the same column now as you used and you pour that through it, but that water you're not saving. 
Although for most pasta dishes, I always remember saving like a half a cup or a cup to moisten the stuff, you know, as you get going. But you, you will not need that for this because we have a lot of stock. Anyhow, you pour it in, rinse it off to get rid of the starch so it won't all clump together. You put it in the bowl and I, I put a little bit of olive oil or, or neutral oil in that again, just to let it, so it won't all clump together. Now your mise en place, as they say in France, is all done, are you prep? And now you come to time either later on that day when you're gonna serve it or the next day, you get a small pan again and a saute pan or a rondo type of little high side. And you throw in your garlic with some uh, a couple of tablespoons of butter and olive oil mix. Saute the garlic until you get the aroma up. Now you take your broth and you put it in there and you bring it up to a boil. The minute it gets to a boil, you turn it down to a simmer, add the pasta. The pasta sits in there for four to five minutes, picks up all the flavors, gets reheated, and swirl it around. Next thing in goes your nice little boil of fresh plump meat. All done, you let that in there for two, two, two and a half minutes. It's all, all you're doing again is putting heat through it into bowls, nice loaf of crusty bread, some more wine, or you can take some other good beverage which we might be discussed in the future. And you're off for a very enjoyable evening. So from clams and greeny to mussels routine. Enjoy. Oh, all right. And this is a situation where the, the shellfish is out of the shell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the shells are gone. The shells are not in the way now. Because sometimes with linguine and clams, it will be presented with the shells. Well, that's if you're doing it in a, in, a, in a restaurant setting, Mark. Some people do the a la minute. It's all done at once. And that's fine with the shells. In it. But I'm talking about this when I, I preface this by saying we're doing for a group of people. And you, in, in a home, you, you don't want to spend all day having plucking shells out of getting them out. Then you don't have to have bowls to get rid of the shells. Mm -hmm. the table uh, so this is all pre prepped ahead of time and you know you get the meat when it's at best with any shellfish but especially mussels they shrivel up when they get cooked you know cooked too long become bitter so you want them in the nice and plump this way everything is all done you get a nice bowl full of pasta as i say a spoonful of both the muscle meat the pasta and the nice juice and it's just a much more enjoyable way of eating and especially for the person preparing it uh, it takes them probably 12 to 15 minutes to put this pull this together. And you're not, you know, spending time away from your friends. Although if you have most open kitchens now have these counter setups. So I suppose you can cook behind that. But it's just it's a much easier way to do it. Anything that you're pre-prep is always easier to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we're doing something interesting today to go with our pasta. And we're going to be playing off uh, the nice fat component. So a little bit of extra alcohol actually is quite helpful in that regard. And also just choosing something that's refreshing that goes with the lighter palate of the dish. So this is something of an anomaly, but this is a Junmai Jinjo sake from the Willamette Valley area. And uh, so not, not from Japan, it's made in the exact same way as a Japanese sake would be made the uh, Toji, the brewer, is uh, experienced in the Japanese sake industry, but he now lives outside of Portland and they make this, uh, this product. They started importing sake in 92, and then they started making their own around 97. So it's in a, in a can, as you have seen and can hear. Where sake is concerned, if you have Junmai in the, uh, in the name of the particular style of sake, it means there's no added alcohol. If you don't see Junmai, if you just see Ginjo or Dai Ginjo, it means there's a little bit of brewer's alcohol that's been added for flavor. It's not like fortifying with port. You know, it's, it's a small amount, but it's still a little bit different. So this is just made from rice and water and of course uh, your koji mold. So we have a really, Saline nose again, perfect with shellfish. And kind of getting some uh, some mild melon notes. And just a really clean flavor. It almost, from a pairing perspective, if you think of muscadet, 
even though Moose Day would probably be about 3% at least less alcohol, it still is palate cleansing, refreshing, you know, kind of like having nuts on the bar. It makes you want to eat more as opposed how do you compare, how do you compare the taste of sake to wine? You, you mentioned Muscadet, but it's it well, I mean it's it's brewed much more like beer. So your the rice is essentially becomes your your mash that they then add the mold to, then you press it out. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is the big quality indicator in sake is the uh, polishing the rice, it's getting the fat and proteins off the grain, so it's pure starch inside. And for this category, for the, uh, the Dai Ginjo, um, excuse me, for the Ginjo, you have to have at least 40% polished off. This particular one has 42%. So you, you have to think of it as, you know, it's a little bit more alcoholic than wine in general. But it, it's really, it's kind of its own category. Right, rice wine isn't necessarily a great descriptor, even though that's kind of how it was sold to this country when it first was being imported. Sort of a hollow a drink. The, yes, oh man. Yeah, it's uh, quite, oh wow. All right, um, as always a great pleasure to, uh, to speak with you all. Um, he's like cracking me up at the end of each segment now. This, this can't go on. Um, Thank you, Dad, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye, Michael. Thank you.